Nilesh, I think uh, VC sir is there. We can start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nilesh, you can start. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I I uh, welcome you, uh, Professor uh, Lance Fung, uh, for this uh, uh, session. So we are uh, JP University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, we are situated in uh, Madhya Pradesh, state of Madhya Pradesh, in India. We offer uh, engineering courses like B.Tech, M.Tech, and uh, Ph.D. Along with this, we also offer B.Sc. and M.Sc. programs. So along with me, uh, faculty members and uh, faculty members have joined this uh, session, uh, live session, and students have also joined this session using live streaming. So uh, we have sir, with us uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor J.S.P. Rai. So uh, he will uh, say a few words. Professor Lenz, I'm really grateful that you have given some time and to address the faculty and the research scholars as well as some students of this university. It's really a pleasure and uh, I expect that definitely the faculty and the students will be benefited from your large huge experience in the field. The area, whatever you have selected, is uh, recently everybody, because of this pandemic situation, we are really strive off. And it is expected that you will give certain ideas which will definitely help this university and the, its faculty. Thank you very much, sir.
Thank you so much, Professor Wright. Patel, sir, unmute yourself. Patel, sir, unmute. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, now, uh, I invite our uh, Dean Academic and Research, Professor Shishir Kumar, uh, to give brief introduction of uh, Professor uh, Lance Fung. Please, sir. Good afternoon, sir. On behalf of uh, JP University of Engineering and Technology, which is uh, located at uh, Guna district of Madhya Pradesh, Pradesh province of India, we welcome you for this session. Your session was uh, long awaited and uh, we are fortunate that today it has been scheduled and we will be having interaction with you on the topic which you had suggested as four in, fourth industrial revolution and emerging technology. Just uh, I had picked some few lines of your introduction, sir. I will read out those few lines uh, about you for information to our faculty members and especially for the students. But before that, sir, I wish to mention it to you and bring it to your notice that we are running a student branch of C Computer Society of India here. And uh, the participation of students as well as faculty members are very large in this activity. And we are benefited with the support and input provided by Computer Society of India in various dimensions of uh, technical inputs and technical developments. We are very active in that domain and will be fortunate to have uh, input of Professor like you. For introduction of Professor Lance Kung, uh, I just wish to mention that he is ME in System Test Technology from University of Wales. After that, he has completed PhD from University of Western Australia. And uh, his uh, area of PhD was application of arti artificial intelligence technique to electrical power system engineering. And uh, this has been, uh, he has worked for uh, Singapore Polytechnic Institute. He has also worked for Curtin University of Technology, Murdoch, and he's working there from 2003. He has supervised more than 30 postgraduate and doctoral students and published more than 330 academic articles. Currently, he is very active in IEEE Technical Program Integrity Committee, and uh, which is uh, uh, which is currently located at IEEE R10 uh, section. The best part is that he is a nominated candidate for IEEE 2022, 2122 Asia Pacific region uh, director elect for which voting is under process. Sir, uh, my best wishes to you for your uh, successful venture with the IEEE and will pray and will wish, will support you that you should be successful in this dimension. That's all from my side, sir. I wish a very, a very good interaction will take place today. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, sir. Uh, now I invite uh, Professor uh, Dan Spoon for his uh, uh, to uh, enli enlighten us with this exercise, sir. Please, sir. OK. Good afternoon, and thank you very much uh, for the introductions. And thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you for the Vice Chancellor, Professor J.P. Rai and also from Professor Sushi Kuma uh, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my background later on. Uh, in particular, I would like to share with you some information uh, whereby I hope that you may, you may also find it useful. The topic I have today is the 4IR and the emerging technologies. Well, the 4IR is the fourth industrial re revolution. And well, I do not really claim myself to be a, a leading expert well, in the area, in the center. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are properly audible, sir. No issue. All right. Okay, so come back to the point that, well, I do not see myself just going to give you one hour lecture on any specific of these technology, well, that uh, drive the uh, four industrial revolution. But I hope that I'm going to come here to you uh, as a messenger or as a pointer that uh, I would like to share with you some of the information that we have from the IEEE resources. And well, they are available well to both the members and the non-members as well. So I hope that for those of you who are in search or in uh, different aspects of the 4IR, 
but I hope that you may find that useful. And that is my main mission that my time going to share with you today. Okay. So, well, my name is Lance Funk, and I'm from well, Murdoch University. And uh, again, I'll talk a little bit later on when I give you a big introduction of my background. And I take this uh, opportunity to well, also thank you for, for Professor Vipin uh, Tayagi uh, for the introductions and uh, for the invitations um, from JP University. And I also understand that he has been uh, playing quite a dominant uh, role in the Vice President of Computer Society of India and also President of Engineering Science Section on the Indian well, Science and Congress Association. I do see it is important well, uh, for us, apart from doing our own academic work and research, that we need to be involved with the professional organization so that we, we need to be uh, networking, collaboration, and also knows well, what's going on so that uh, we can help well and also enlighten the student as well. But I also heard that about the mention of me being the one of the candidates of the coming elections. I would also like to uh, mention my other candidates as well, uh, Professor uh, Subhavadi uh, from Thailand and also um, Professor Nonlisa from uh, Malaysia and also uh, Professor Celia from Bangladesh. And I, I, do believe, I do believe all of them are, are the worthy candidates as well. But of course, if any well vote and if I can gain your trust, I'd be very appreciative. So the disclaimer is, well, I'm giving that um, this is entirely my opinion and experience I talk about on this topic, and they're not necessarily the IEEE. And the information, so they are also publicly available well, online. So I encourage you to look it up well, for yourself. And I, I believe that while well, you have an undergraduate student, postgraduate students, and also researchers, faculty members, actually, and a non actually delegates as well. What I plan for you today is, well, I give a little bit background well, about myself. In particular, I would like to share with you some resources well, you can download well, from our university website. And then I do a quick introduction of IEEE. Well, it's not so much I'm, I'm doing any membership promotion or those kind of things, but I would really like to share with you that our organization so that you can understand well, how IEEE is driving well, behind these um, uh, four industrial revolutions. So I'm, I'm going to point out some of these emerging technologies and some of the initiatives well, our organization well, have been supporting it. And I also take a look in terms of the IEEE roadmap. Well, so this is a, another, I, I consider maybe not too many people are aware of this one, but I do consider this is important because well, some of these reports are looking into 15 years um, uh, horizon. We're looking into some kind of forecast, well, from the experts, well, and from the industry, and also from the academics. So, where am I now? Well, I, I took the liberty to check for, from the internet, and I know this is um, your university, well, somewhere in the north, um, middle part of um, India. I do have the opportunity to visit a couple of the uh, coastal cities, well, of India. I've been to um, uh, Chennai, I've been to uh, Kolkata, Vizag Bay, well, on the East Coast. And on the West Coast, I have um, visited Mumbai and uh, Gujarat and also uh, Kuchi. But uh, there are so many places I would like to visit, and I hope that one day I can visit your campus as well. Well, my university is located in the West Coast of Australia. Well, it's somewhere in here. And, um, well, we are the second oldest university coming to 50 years now, established in 19, I think, uh, 20 years history now. And the other two universities are Curtin University, where I we were 14 years before, and also E.D. Carbon University. We have only one private university called the Notre Dame University, affiliated with Notre Dame in the uh, USA. So in order to get to know a little bit about myself, well, you can take a look at our university website. You just simply search Murdoch University Profile Lance Fund, and you will come to this page. And then you can scroll down and take a look at some of those um, particular pull down menu, and then you can click to the other pages as well. In terms of my personal background, well, I was started as a radio officer. Well, looking back, it's close to 150 years now. I graduated in 1974, and then I spent another one more year in UK. And I, I did my undergraduate master's degree in University of Wales and also my PhD from University of Western Australia. I taught in Singapore, I taught in Curtin University, and I taught in Murdoch University. Officially, I retired in 2015, but I received an emeritus uh, position, which is an honorary appointment. So effectively, I'm still with the, with the university. Well, I, I'm still uh, doing a bit of supervision. But in a way that I'm not doing any uh, full-time administration or teaching role now. Well, in the past, I also held some of the position in the administration role, well, like the associate dean of research, research directors, and also well, director for one of the research center. 
Well, for the past few years, well, I spent well, well, most of my time, well, more or less become like full time now for, for uh, IEEE. Well, currently I'm the Region 10 Educational Activities Committee. In the past, I also spent quite a fair bit of time on the Conference Quality Committee. And that is the one more or less responsible ensuring the quality of the proceedings uh, in the IEEE Explore. And also be in the new initiatives committee. Well, this is quite an important committee within IEEE because well, we fund a lot of those major initiatives. And some of those are related to this emerging technology I'm going to talk about very shortly. On the technical society, I've also been on the board of governors for the IEEE System and Cybernetic Society for six years. And also locally within the geographical arrangement, I've been in the section chapters and the region as well. The reason I'm showing some of these photos is well, well, the first one is 1974. I was on my first assignment on the Merchant Navy. The second one, 1976, uh, my second ship. But what I'm really amazed at how the technology have changed over the years. That well, the 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 equipment behind me is the, is the transmitter. Well, it's only output one kilowatt. Well, but it can send out well by Morse code. Well, I think the most I have is uh, from the south uh, southern tip of uh, Africa, from Cape Town. All the way I can communicate to uh, London, so more or less well, all across the globe, well, just in Morse code. But the key thing is I observe is the technology is, is in particular at that time, the satellite technology being great, gradually coming in. So when I get on my second ship, we begin to make use of the satellite position fixing. Now we use the uh, Google map uh, for granted, but uh, that was the first time they come. And also you don't really have 24 hour access of the satellite signal. You only have to wait until the satellite you pass through uh, on top, then you can get a position fixing. And then gradually they come into the emergency signal. And now when I go on cruising uh, on the ship, I can get an internet connection for 24 hours. So you can imagine how it has changed over the years. The last photo is, well, when I did my master's degree, uh, it was the first time I encountered a microprocessor. It was a Motorola 6, uh, 8-bit uh, 6800 um, uh, uh, CPU. And that was the first time I, I developed uh, 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 a micro base, uh, microprocessor-based system. And uh, again, well, looking well, from 1981 until now, well, in the span of 40 years, uh, how the microprocessors and computer technology have changed over the years. So you can imagine now, well, what is going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, especially a lot of you, well, in the students, well, you are going to live well until that time as well. So it's really important for us well, to keep abreast what's going on and well, really need to, to be involved with the technology that's coming up and also for the future as well. In terms of my academic well, uh, contribution, you can take a look at the website. You can see something like the list of the publication. Well, in there they have um, uh, collected 334 papers. Although some of the papers, well, they were not included because they were in the old well, paper format, but they're not in the 20 format. But nevertheless, well, the key things I would like to share with you is you can download most of this information. Even if you cannot get a full paper, you can get the abstract. So by doing that, you can have a glimpse of what the work I've done before. And on top of that, well, my university also have the, the data and how this information has been used over the years. And you have, uh, well, told me that, well, from the um, September 20, uh, 2009 until now, well, my papers have been downloaded over 62,000 times. Well, for these are 300 something papers. And some of the well, highest one have been downloaded well, over uh, 5,000 times. So the first one downloaded 5,206 times. And uh, that particular paper, actually, it was published in uh, 2006. Okay, it was a paper called Similarities and Difference Between the Learn Full Play and the Edutainment. And you can see some of these. This paper is still well downloaded even up to now. Well, you can see that um, up to over 20 times, well, in August of 2020. And then also in terms of the actual number of, of download, this is the highest one, over 5,000 times. And you can see over the years, it has been downloaded consistently. Well, I would say one of the main reasons is because uh, we do run some uh, courses on the games. So that's why a lot of um, the students, they would like to take a look at that one, what has been done in the past. And then well, the other one, well, it's quite some times now. This is 2008. Well, we're talking about uh, cybersecurity. And then we're talking about a pilot study, again, using games. And um, this particular paper was downloaded 723 times. And again, it's still all the way up to now. Well, in July 2020, well, this paper still has been downloaded. And more importantly, this particular paper, well, we use um, some tools well, from the US Naval Postgraduate School. 
okay? This particular game is called Cyber Siege. And while well, it's publicly available, well, you, you can get access to that. You know, we are pleasantly pleased to find that well, even our paper was being recognized well, by the website, and that it was well, well considered as one of the early papers. Well, we have, um, well, we have uh, do some assessment on that based in 2008. So on that basis, I see it's important well, for us well, as academic that well, after we have written the papers, uh, we hope that well, the paper is going to be used, it's going to be downloaded, it's going to be read. It doesn't really matter if it's being cited or not. To me, it's, it's relevant. Well, the most important is well, those ones that are still making contribution. But for the student, well, I, I hope that this other part of the information will be useful for you. Is so you can take a look at the complete thesis, not only from my work, from any staff within our university. So you can see that well, they have collected 31 of the thesis. And then you can click on any of these and take a look well at the papers, at, at, at the thesis. So you will also see that I cover quite a broad um, topic. Well, I cover things like information security, well, um, IT strategies, uh, a lot of learning, uh, games, and also some of the uh, IT neural network and those type of work as well. Well, if you click on any of those um, uh, theses, so say for example, this is one of my earliest students, and uh, her name is um, Javla. She is from Bahrain. And that particular thesis was published in 2008. And then was something on knowledge management strategy uh, for the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council. And that thesis, you can see, well, um, was done over 3,251 uh, times. Well, at the early times, well, it was published, uh, it was downloaded quite a bit. Well, I'm not surprised that at that time, because Jeff had gone back to University of Bahrain to teach. And, um, but even up to now, well, you can see that August 2020, you still have a few downloads as well. well another one, this is uh, from uh, Thailand, my student, um, Jinjara, uh, Knowledge Management Platform for Promoting Sustainable Energy Technology in Rural Thai Communities. So what you see is well, you can take a look at the abstract and download the front pages and you can download the full thesis. So again, this particular one has been downloaded around well, close to uh, 1,800 times. And again, recently it has been downloaded a few times as well. So I'm hoping that well, these are the things I do consider is, is really useful well, for the student. Uh, this is quite different compared to the past now. Well, in the early days when I first started my PhD, if I want to take a look at the people's thesis, I have to go to the library, I have to take it out and I can't even borrow a ticket home. And I have to, well, use even, sometimes even use a glove, well, just make sure I don't dirty the thesis. But nowadays, well, all these are e uh, easily accessible well, online now. So for those of you who are really looking into further study research, well, there might be a good opportunity to you know, take a look at those information. In terms of the public information, you can find out from the places like the Google Scholar. So this is the one give you a number of citations that I have, uh, is collected 3,682. I wouldn't consider myself as a tip-top uh, researcher. I have seen researchers that are much, much higher of citation, well, hundreds of thousands and maybe much higher actually index. But the main thing is, well, I, I'm really pleased to find out some of the work we've done in the past is still being cited. Well, like the, my most cited paper is, was published in 1993. It was part of my PhD work with my late supervisor. Uh, it's one of the earliest work well, on using the uh, simulator and earring. Well, now it's, it's a, a, automation techniques. Well, in the economic dispatch algorithm, it's really one of the problems in, um, in power engineering. And that particular paper is still being cited, as you can see from 1993, even up to well, uh, 2020, well, this particular paper is still being cited, well, now close to around five, 500 times. And some other um, platform you can see from ResearchGates, um, Explore, uh, Scoopers as well. Scoopers that collected around 200 of my papers, and give me index of 16, uh, uh, 1180 times. So all in all, the main thing I just want to share with you in here is, I hope that if some of my past papers and some of the thesis will be useful to you, you're more than welcome to take a look. You can also take a look at the work from my other colleagues as well. And also uh, I would encourage you that if you well, encounter some work from other researchers, uh, take your time to take a look at the public information. Take a look at the Google Scholar, Scoopers, and you can find out further work from the same author. So I hope that this will be help you for, for your research work. Now, come to the main part. I will quickly well, give a quick introduction of IEEE. As I said, the main objective is not so much about well, just simply trying to promote the organization. I, I'm not well, a salesman. I'm not selling you anything at all. I just want to make you aware, well, as the researcher, as a student, but one thing you should really get yourself aligned with some kind of um, professional organization. 
because of the professional organization, you, you have a common mission and vision and also help to enhance well, your career and also provide you the opportunities well, well for the networking and also for the resources as well. So IEEE stands for Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. We are the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefits of humanity. So in other words, our mission, uh, what we work together within the well, professional organization, where we're aiming to advance the technology and we want to bring benefits well, to humanity. So you can find out further information. I just briefly, very quickly, go through some of these, um, well, what we call it, quick facts well, about IEEE. Again, all these are public information. You can download our 2019, well, and you report, and you will see that we have close to a four, well, over 420,000 members worldwide. And member wise, well, India, actually, you're the second highest, well, as far as country is concerned. The highest is USA, and then followed by China. In terms of student members, well, you have the highest. You have around 35,000, okay, followed by USA and China. The key thing is, well, actually, our resources are within our digital library. Uh, th that is the one that uh, we have collected all those um, papers uh, from the proceedings, transactions, or journals, or magazines, et cetera, et cetera. So we are also subdivided into geographical regions of 10 regions. So I'm standing for as, as a director for one of the uh, regions. But our, our technical information uh, all come from our technical societies. So we have um, well, 39 technical societies. Now, I, I understand that among the audience, not necessarily all of you are, are within the electrical, electronics, or computer disciplines. But you might have some, well, in the other discipline, like mechanical engineering. But well, some of these societies, you may find that they are relevant to you. Say, for example, we have the robotic and automation societies. We have control, well, uh, engineering as well. And also we have things like um, the people working in the medical field, where well, we have the uh, EMBS, uh, engineering medical um, um, the science as well, okay? Uh, engineering in medicine and uh, biology society, EMBS, okay? So these are the examples. But we also have some other societies well, dedicated just for education. And also we have a professional communication, um, technical uh, man engineering management as well. So those are some other well, society is not necessarily, it must be under the electrical and electronic engineering. So, well, from all these societies, well, we have, well, come up with a lot of these uh, uh, most successful technology companies. Well, they are subscribed to, to our library as well. So you can see that out of the top 30 companies, well, 29 of them subscribe to the library so that they can access to the information. In the aerospace and defense, our 15 top companies, 14 of them subscribe to our well, library. So you can see that IEEE, our main resources, our main source of asset actually is our knowledge and our knowledge is stored in our library. But you will also hear that I'm talking about some other resources as well for the education and further uh, education. Some of these you will see me talk about this very shortly. Our main thing in terms of the emerging technologies are being led by, by some of the committees like the Future Directions Committee. And a lot of these are being funded by the new initiatives committee, well, whereby I have the honor and pleasure of being the chairperson last year, and I've been on the committee for six or seven years. So we are supporting a lot of these well, uh, emerging technologies. Or you can see that it's going to, you might heard some of the terminologies already. Uh, I'll come back to each one of these very shortly. And I'll show you where you can find the information and resources well, from all these initiatives. And then from here, well, you can see that, well, we also well, um, work with the future leaders as well. Well, part of the uh, missions, um, a strategic plan of IEEE is we also provide the career development as well. So through the young professionals, these are referred to those members. They have, graduate, uh, they have graduated and then uh, within the 15 years, so they're being classified as a young professionals. And then we also have uh, places like the um, entrepreneurship, well, to help well, the people to start a business and start up and all those things. And also we have the learning resources well, through this uh, ILN, the um, IEEE Learning Network. Well, again, you can see the list of the most uh, popular, most interested, uh, AI, um, Internet of Things, IoT, Big Data, 5G, Smart Grid. All those, again, I will show you all these initiatives very shortly. And then we also have our Explore, you have already heard. We have over 5 million well, um, documents inside there. And also being added every year. So through these individual well, articles, well, they submitted through the conference journals and, and, and each month well, around 20 or so. And through the journals, magazines, conferences, 
Well, the standard is quite important because they are linked with the industry, you know, providing the guideline and then some agreement of what to work on. And also the learning resources for like the e-learning and also the e-book as well. E-book is particularly useful in particular for those students. Well, a lot of them, they are also provided free of charge. Well, some of them, well, you might have to pay, but you also get some discount being a student. And then also in terms of the publication, as an academic, well, one of the important criteria is just looking at some kind of citation. So you, that's why you heard me just show you some of my citation as well. So a lot of these, well, journals, they are being considered in terms of the ranking. It's really how often they're being cited. So for those that are being most cited, well, top 20 as well, uh, are the electrical, electronic engineering, top four are in the automation and controls, well, top three in the cyber uh, netics, well, number one in the industrial engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can see is, well, actually, well, I would proud to say that we are doing our part and also it's being recognized where well, the information are useful well, by the researchers, well, in the disciplines. Well, for the student, we also have well, this particular competition well, if you are student members, or you have a team in a university, you're eligible to have the NU Extreme uh, Programming Competitions. As you can see, well, this is the NU event. And um, well, last year, you have around over 4,000 teams from 800 universities. It's a 24 hours well, uh, competition of programming with some kind of set of uh, real world uh, programming programs. Okay, so the, the top prize was go to one uh, Illinois, uh, University of Illinois in USA. Okay, in terms of organizations, well, you have already heard that we have 10 regions. So 10 regions, well, we are in region 10, well, you are in India, I'm in Australia, so we are part of the Asia Pacific. We make up around, around one third well, of the membership within um, the whole IEEE organization, followed by the region eight, which is the Africa, well, Europe, uh, Middle East, and Russia. And then there's uh, South America, Latin America, the make of the region nine. And region one to six, uh, all in US eight. And also the region seven is, the, uh, is Canada. So we've been Asia Pacific region. So we have around 59 sections and uh, 39 subsections. So in India, we have 12 sections. So you also quite a number of subsections as well. You also make up a council, India council. Similarly, you have in China, your Korea, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia. But well, some of the smaller countries, well, they may not have a section, like in Bhutan, uh, Nepal, uh, Nepal, so they have a subsection. So the, the organization and the management of IEEE is, I always say, is a member organization. So we make up, well, the 40,000, 400,000 or so members, and then, well, they are, well, they belong to a certain geographical location. So if you're a student, you'll be under student well, if you are a member, you are under the section according to ge geographical uh, uh, locations. And then you're under the uh, Indian Council, then we are under the Region 10. And collectively, well, all these sections of 300 something or so are under this MGA well, memberships, uh, members and geographics uh, activities board. Well, if you are in the technical field, you heard me mention about the 39 technical societies. And then also they have some technical council of a common interest. Then they are under the technical activities board. And our main, well, asset is under the publication. That's why we have publication service and products board and education activities board, standard association board, and also the USA board that oversee, well, uh, um, region one to nine, uh, one to six. So you can see this is the overall, well, 32 well, members within the board of uh, directors. So if I were lucky enough to be uh, successful as one of the region director, so I'll be representing the region in this uh, board of directors. So this is the made up. So again, I repeat in terms of this um, allocation, according if you're a student, you're a student brand. Well, if you're a member, you'll be in the section, you'll be in the regions, and also the couple of the committees uh, under the, the board. Well, organizational chart, or there are quite a lot of, of committees within each of these boards. So the key thing I would like to say is, well, being a member, you can also be a volunteer. You also have a lot of opportunities that you can serve within the organization. So for the technical interest, then this is where you can find specific area. So if you talk about the emerging technologies, which I will cover very shortly, you're talking about these different societies. I'm picking a few as an example. Well, obviously, well, the computer and IT well, will be one of the key things in our four industrial revolution because we are talking about cyber physical system. 
So I'm just picking some of these, well, which um, are having the major, well, driver behind this revolution. Well, I'm talking about a computational intelligence society. This is the one related to all this uh, AI and or, or nature, well, inspired the type of algorithm. Uh, computer society, again, is pretty obvious. Well, you heard me talk about uh, how to serve the change of the computer technology in the past 40 years. Robotic and automation, again, I mentioned this already. Again, I took the assumption. Some of you from the mechanical department, you might be interested in this. This is the man as a fanatic. Well, this is my home society. I've been with you for over, well, 20, over close to 30 years. So this is the one that looking into the system level, looking at the human computer interface, and also looking at cybernetics. So each one of these, well, what you can do is, now you, you join Attribute as a member. Okay, you have, you get all the basic information, you can accept well, most of these um, abstract, you're not necessarily publication, all the five million or so, because you need to have a subscription. Sometimes some of the users, they may have a subscription and some of the company, they do that as well. Otherwise, so you may need to get a society membership before you can get the society's publication. So it all depends what is interest. So say for example, like the computation system. So you just simply search for well, IEEE, Computational Intelligence well, Society, and this is what you'll find out. So most of these websites are very similar. They tell you something about the background, or what do they publish, or what are the events they have, or what are the conferences. But more importantly, well, if you are a Get involved as well. You can get involved, you can fool the publication. But more importantly, I would suggest a look involved into the technical committee and also go into the editorial part as well. And by doing that, you have a much more well, a closer involvement and also understand well all the publication and the work in, in, in that society. So this is a description of what the society is all about. So it's a network of pioneers who are interested in nature, inspired problem solving techniques well, like the neural network, evolutionary algorithm, fuzzy systems, uh, hyper intelligence system, etc. And also looking at the big data, internet of things. So those are the emerging technologies under the 4IR. So if you're a member, you can assess to the periodicals for conference discount, and et cetera, et cetera. Same thing applied to the robotic and um, automation society. So this is the one for the development and facilitate the exchange of scientific and technological knowledge in robotics and automation. And we enter discount on the conferences and the events and the network opportunities. Well, in particular, if you are if you are researchers or maybe if you are a student doing a PhD work, well, some point in time that you may need to attend conferences. But for those uh, under IEEE, being a member, you will enjoy the discount. But same thing applies to system and cybernetics. So in this case, we're looking at the advancement of the theory and application in system science and engineering and the human and the machines interface and also cybernetics. So again, you got the same thing. You can assess to and conference, et cetera. So this is the first part I'm going to share with you that being an IEEE member, well, you should also look into the society subscription. So by doing that, you can engage and looking into certain discipline. Okay. Then now let's look into the four IR now. So the first question is what is the four IR? So if you go back to history, well, we can broadly talk about this four well, era of the change of what we call the revolution over the years. Of course, the first one is, well, for many hundred years, well, people have been relying on the human power and the animal, cattle or, 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 or horse. That's why we have... Um, so really, it's a very limited. Well, what uh, discovered the use of the steam engine then you see that first of all, well, you have the steam machine that can have a, well, the power and, and the energy uh, can be delivered. Well, of course, well, you can be in a factory situations. And also, well, you have the steam well, engine well, on a train and maybe well, transport. So by doing that, it expand, well, the reach of the human. Uh, in, in the past, where well, you have to rely on a horse driven car or, or car. Well, the human being is able to reach out to much further. You see the cases like in USA, well, how they go well, from the East Coast well, all the way up to the West Coast. Then the next era coming into electricity. But what are the limitations of using energy is very limited. Well, hydraulic pipes and, and also 
uh, by going, you can already go too far away. And also, uh, it's really intensive in, in terms of using the, the, the steam engine. Of course, uh, I have forgotten talking about the steamship as well. So there comes the electricity. So electricity, well, the main thing is, well, now you're able to well, deliver uh, well, uh, or deliver the energy a much more distance and also much more well, widely being used in the country. And you can see how the electrification and also uh, enhance the, the development of the industry and also home and also home appliances, etc. And that is from the beginning of the well um, 19th century or so. Then we move on to the computer. Well, then maybe I was looking in the last well, 50 or 60 years. As you have heard about from my first encounter of microprocessor until now, you can see how the computer equipment has changed over the years. Well, how the in terms of the terms of the story. And tell you, my first computer was called S, uh, Sinclair X S81. You only get 1K memory, okay, 1K running on an 8 bit microprocessor. If I want to have more memory, I have to pay for another additions, 4K, all right. And how the storage being done on the audio tape, okay, I plug in the audio tape and then store the program. So very interesting, and people even can play games on it, okay, you'll be amazed. And then, and then reasoning. Well, I would say that maybe for the, well, since the internet, I mean, coming, now we come to the fourth uh, industry now, it is cyber physical system. So the characteristic of this one is, well, not only with the computing um, technologies, we also have the, in terms of the communication well, through the internet. So we can also have the wireless, so you can have a much more massive amount of data being collected and also miniaturization of the devices. You can collect a lot of the information anywhere. Just like I'm wearing a mo well, uh, Apple Watch, okay? In this case, I it collect my, my heartbeat when I go for exercise, you collect, well, even when I swim, you, you can, you can well, register, well, what, is, what was my heartbeat and how fast, even what style I was swimming. So you can see, this is where the industrial well, fourth revolutions will come in, that whereby you have the availability of all these devices, where well, you can variable devices, you can uh, internet of things, collect all this information. Now I was at this, at the point of time, I would also like to introduce you another, well, um, not necessarily on a 4IR, but I would like to introduce you this particular website called IEEE Rich. It stands for Raising Engineering Awareness Through the Conduit of History. Well, I would say it's, it's, it's interesting that you can look back to history, well, how technology have changed over the years as well. So you can go back to earlier on how the radio and how the even the skyscraper and even drone as well, you also mentioned how it has been used in the, in the Second World War. So if you look into this particular website, well, you have this. Inquiry units, ready.
Okay, am I back in? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why it has been uh, dropped out. I'm not sure it my side or not. Okay, I'm coming back to this uh, presentation now. I hope it's coming through. Yes, sir. This okay. Um, okay, I'm back in. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Well, right. so I'm coming back to, uh, to the resources as you can see in here. Well, I mentioned about uh, although it's not necessarily the, exactly the latest one but as i said well it's really important for, for the student to know where do we come from and then you have these multimedia sources we're talking about how the history edisons the elevators well the, the radio and and i would say it's really useful well either you can use some kind of uh, at the earlier part of the um, of the course or maybe even uh, teach it to the community as well and you also have some hand-on exercises as well, I'm making a live bulb with the batteries while using a drone as well. Now, coming back to 4IR now, well, one of the statements was saying that during the 4IR, well, due to 4IR, 65% of the students starting primary school will eventually work in jobs that does not exist yet. This was from the World Economic Forum. So when you think about that, it's really quite a challenge for us for being the researchers uh, and also in the academic. So really, how are we gonna prepare our students? Because bear in mind that, well, even I look at uh, our, our undergraduate student, and uh, well, when they come out in a couple of years' time, well, they really have to encounter, they learn a lot of things well, from scratch as well. So even I look at myself, my career, even though I started off well, as a radio officer, and then uh, more or less, well, I trained for telecommunication, that go into, well, um, the control, and then um, I, I, I taught, well, telecommunication, electronics, instrumentations, and then when I come to well, Curtin, I taught computer engineering. And then well, when I come to uh, Murdoch, I taught IT. And then I do research work. Well, although mainly a lot of those are in AI, but I also do a lot of other education, et cetera. So one really need to prepare, well, in terms of all the changes. So what are the technology we're talking about? So from the IEEE point of view, our Explore has a major part to play well, with all this uh, for IR technology. It's you can see in here, you talk about uh, autonomous vehicles, talk about internet of things. So the number of uh, papers are related you know, to, in particular, a lot of well, they used it in the patents as well. So you talk about um, 3D printing, autonomous uh, robots, uh, big data, augmented reality, cybersecurity, internet of things, cloud, or uh, system integration, autonomous vehicles. So all these, well, each one of them can stand alone. Well, it's have a major part to play in the fourth industrial revolution. So some of these, well, I guess you can see from here. They say the top 30 patenting organizations cited IEEE over three times more than the other publisher. So these are the, well, uh, just simply a, a summary, okay, from IEEE point of view, well, for the past 20 years of the patent, 51 of those well, percent of those patents have reference to some documentation from IEEE on top of IOTs, Internet of Things. Well, you can see Internet of Things is expected to grow well between 2015 to 2025. It's going to be 15 trillions. Okay, so you can see some of the uh, reports on some of the work in IEEE. Robotics, obviously, is in other areas. So again, you can see quite a no high number of the references well, for the patents are being referred to the IEEE Explore, 43% of those. So with the 4IR, the prevalence of the robotic society will be one of the most notable changes. Robots are already utilized in manufacturing facilities around the world, but a few robotics is not limited to manufacturing. The autonomous robot, we have a robot that can be existing like humanoid. We can even keep people, uh, um, company. Well, my daughter, well, she was, um, she, her undergraduate is in health science. Well, her master degree is a therapist. After she worked for a few years as an occupational therapist, and now she ended up having a job with this company called uh, Striker. And the specialization is the um, equipment while doing hip and knee replacement, those kind of work in a hospital. And she is now being trained as a robotic operator. Well, helping out the surgeons well, within the operating theater. So you can see, well, how I can see her, her, her job career change. 
Well, it looks like that her health science in the first year the de uh, undergraduate degree is only providing her to fundamental uh, training, uh, understanding the human anatomy of those kind of things. Occupational therapy, she, she did some work while doing some rehab work uh, in the hospital. But really, well, she enjoyed now very much as well, but she has gone through very tough training, well, on how to robot. What? So you can see that, yes. So in here, over 3 million industrial robots will be in operation well, globally by application. Autonomous vehicle, again, is expected another major area is going to change. We have already seen the driverless car is already well, coming onto the road. And also, it may also affect a lot of job market as well. But nevertheless, you can see that well, again, well, out of the references for the IEEE, well, 58% of all those patents have made reference to, to our articles we can explore. So self-driving cars well, could save 500 billion each year in US by reducing the 94% of accidents caused by human errors, okay? So you can see that, well, it's not only going to be just simply make the car safer, it also will reduce the accidents, will reduce the damages to life and also for the properties. AI, obviously, well, this has been one of my main areas. As you have heard, uh, my, I started off even my PhD has been AI. Well, although AI, the field is um, six, um, it was all first coined the name, so over four, 60, 70 years now. But it's still ongoing, and we expect that it's still going to make a lot of major changes well, in the 4IR. Again, you can see over one third of those well, patents have made reference to IEEE. Well, more significantly is in terms of the people investment into it. You can see, well, the investment since 2006, Google put in $3.9 billion. Amazon, $871 million. Apple, $786 million. Intel, $776 million. So you can see it's going to be a major area. Well, one of the other slides I've shown in other presentation is, well, well economic forum. Um, actually, it's expecting in terms of the job going to be increased at least double about another article I read, around 58 million jobs is going to be created under AI. But there's another article, so again, uh, when no time is coming up, so I just share another from another organization called Gartners. But in here, they identify top 10 tra uh, technology trend in 2020. Now, Gartner is not an academic research organization, not a government organization. It's a private commercial. But it is well regarded in the industry because well, they serve for those C-level type of uh, people in the organization. I'm talking about CEO, CTO, CIO, CFO, and all those people. So they, they, are, well, they have their own well, researchers and, and their, their research based on, um, is quite thorough. They have a lot of information and pretty expensive information as well. If, if you need to get them, you will pay for them. Well, this was an article well, published uh, end of last year. So they look into some of these trends. They're looking at the five of them under what they call the people-centric, and another five because smart spaces. So I'm going to quickly take a look at all these. All these are part of the emerging technologies. Well, is expecting also happening already. So they call trend number one is called hyper automation. So what it means is well now AI is going to automate a lot of tasks where the ones required the the humans. This is not referring to the me well mechanized uh, activities like the robot. But really, looking at some simple things like, okay, in the past, you require some people, some clerk to look up some information, things like in the uh, legal well, profession. But now they're talking about a lot of these process could be automated. So multi-experience. Well, here is referring to, well, now the information, no longer just getting and the computer, but rather they have a sensory and multi-touch interface as well, like variable and computer sensors as well. So they're able to collect the information. I've used my Apple Watch example to illustrate that already. Democratization, what in, in here is nowadays, well, access to the technology, again, is much, much more easier compared to the past. Well, in the past, well, people working on computer are those, well, specialized people in a room wearing a white coat. But now really a lot of people can access to that. And then, well, it's also, well, you can get it worldwide. You can get outsourced, well, so by doing that, uh, very competitive. Human augmentations. In this case, you can enhance the human ability and the senses as well. Well, not only you can have well things like augmented reality, well, enhance the vision, also you can enhance the physical 
uh, ability as well with something like robotic aided well uh, equipment, and also enhance well your your human connective ability as well, and help you to search information much faster. Well, another aspect looking the information need to be much more transparent and and traceable, because of now people getting concerned with all the data being collected, they need to be well protecting of the individual as well. So it also expect the organization that need to be taking care of this issue. Well, in terms of the smart spaces, well, the first one they look into is called an empowered edge. Well, what it means here is, in terms of technology, it's no longer need to be specialized or centralized, but rather a lot of this information can be done at the edge. What it means in the edge is, if you consider a network, you have a front end sensor to collect the information. In the past, the sensor just doing that, you just measure it, send the information back to the computer, do the calculation, and then the command come down and it's well, work on the actuator. But now the edge referring to the case that a lot of this computational analytics information can be done at the front end. So you do not need to have the data being well up and down and also reduce the latency. So by doing that, uh, you're keeping the local traffic and also reduce latency and distribution. So it makes a lot of difference in terms of control. Because if you talk about control, the latency normally is a delay is one of the issues we have to face. The distributed cloud is another one. So no longer you require to put all the information but within your own uh, 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 devices or computer, but rather we're looking at what we call the cloud. So by doing that, it also provide you the protection as well, in a sense that well, if you have anything happen to your system, uh, your data is being stored as well in terms of the security and also this, uh, we're gonna pay for that as well. Autonomous things. So this is another aspect. We're looking at a lot of these devices that could be well, running on their own. Well, we have already mentioned all autonomous vehicle or the driverless vehicle. You can also go in terms of the well, autonomous well, drones and also the vehicle well, and the ship as well. Practical blockchain. Well, in the past, well, blockchain that caught people's attention because of the issues, well, like the um, Bitcoin, uh, people making a lot of money, that's what they claim. But the main thing is, well, blockchain, well, they have the fundamental problem in terms of scalability. But they are very good um, uh, techniques that could be used, well, in terms of, of the limited uh, application for en enterprise, well, like logistics, so that they can use for authentications. So a lot of work is currently now applying blockchain into the industry. And finally, in terms of the security, uh, no doubt having this uh, IoT and we can get a lot of information, we can get a lot of analytics. Well, but the issue is well, the security becomes very important. So these are the emerging trends, well, emerging technology. So we can see all these key technology can just follow. AI related well, technology and analytic technologies. So we're able to use the deep learning, machine learning, well, big data. Network and communication technology, again, well, we rely on the cyber security, physical, um, uh, uh, cyber physical system. Well, we're expecting you to be able to connect to the internet anytime, anywhere. But brain technology did not ex well, discuss too much earlier on because I, I would say this is only, well, at the beginning part where we begin to learn more of it. But we do consider this is going to be one of the emerging technologies as well. Blockchain is already, well, mentioned that already, and also for computer technology. Again, it's pretty obvious. And AR and VR stand for the virtual reality and augmented reality. As a matter of fact, now we even go more than that now. We go into mix well, XR, um, uh, MR, the mixed uh, reality, and we also go to XR, extended reality as well. So this is where the IGBE new initiatives come in. So as I have mentioned, I have been a member and I've been on the chair as well. As you can see, some of these technology you have heard earlier on, they have been funded by IGBE in the past well, under these initiatives. Internet of Things, it had been funded between 2014 to 2016 to a range of $1.36 million. Big Data, 15 to 17, $925,000. Cybersecurity, okay, 15 to 17. So the key things I would like to show you is IGBE have been taking the preemptive well, operations, supporting these initiatives so maybe that's partly because of how make all these technology being more widely available and also widely being applied. We put in computing, brain initiatives, and currently the one being, well, um, granted is the digital reality. So this is the one related to things like AR, VR, and XR, and MR, and all those things. So what I want to, to share with you is uh, through this, 
they are being led by the future direction committees where well, you can take a look at, at the website but not only just simply telling you that all these uh, uh, initiatives they have the communities so you can be part of it as well or oh, i'm working on that but more importantly you can assess them through the particular website each one of them they have specific websites just simply search IEEE, blockchain, brain initiatives, digital realities. All of those are very similar. Just like what you've seen on the society's website. They talk about, well, well the home and what they are, and what do they do, what are the products, what are the resources, what are the publications, etc. Future networks, quantums, well, rebooting computing, big data. Any one of you are working on big data, machine learning, you will find this particular website is very useful called the data port. So from there, you can download a lot of those uh, data sets so you can use it for experiment. You can also compare other people's results. We have already heard about IoT, cyber security. So, so far, I have mentioned quite a fair bit of information now. Let's come to the last part now. I have talked about IEEE organization. I talked about the societies. I talked about, well, all these initiatives and also talk about 4IR as well. But more importantly, some of this little known information is what we call the technology roadmap. And I consider that important because if you consider 4IR, consider the emerging technology, you really need to look into the future. And this is where this roadmap is all about. And these roadmaps are these specific uh, communities well, whereby people are interested well, and also uh, specialize in this area. They try to look into the further, more on a strategic well, plan so you can go to the website, uh, go to the roadmap, IEEE, ORG, and this is what you see. You will see some of the roadmap has already been publicly made available. Some of those actually is not only the first edition, they might be even available, well, that's the, uh, for the past few years already. So you go to the, the link on the roadmap, you can see some of those roadmaps that are available, and some of those are coming up and also under development. So as an example, the international, well, network, the uh, generation roadmap, INGR, this is the one looking into all these uh, future network. Um, uh, normally they're from the initiatives. You can see example, it's gonna be like this. You do have executive summary. Again, you can download it, well, no problem. Explain what is it all about, different chapters inside there and a table of content. So I'm not going through all this. I leave it to you to take a look. This is the one on the brain machine interfacing. So talking about how do they, uh, propose, uh, propose a standard well, for the industry, well, for the brain interface. So they have the industry, well, connections uh, report, standard roadmaps on the neuro technologies for brain machine interfacing. So in other words, well, next time that, well, you don't even need to type in anything. You don't need to me measure any sensor. Well, in the sense that, well, maybe from the brain wave, well, you can do the control. As a matter of fact, it's already happening, well, this particular technology has been trying to help some people they are immobilized on a wheelchair, so they don't even well, need to move well, the joystick. So they're also inviting participation. So another one is more important, I would say, is the International Roadmap on Devices and Systems. I think this is the third edition. They, they're coming up 2020. They, uh, they have published some few years back already. So again, they have the individual technical well, community. They're looking at different aspects. And they're looking into 15 years horizon, okay? So you can see the executive sum summary. It's pretty massive, around 60 something pages long, okay? So they talk about all these uh, different areas. I would say it's important because well, from the academic point of view, you would like to plan for your curriculum and also plan for the work for the student. For the researcher's point of view, for the PhD student, you will be looking at the ideas of what you want to work on. So I know I'm slightly over time now. So I summarize for what I have discussed so far. So I believe you agree with me that technology has been evolving and emerging technology is shaping the landscape and the business and the daily lives. So we can see that every day, well, you can see new reports coming up, of new findings, new development. Well, I, I can well safely say that IEEE is feeling the fourth industrial revolution. So you can see it from the data well, from the uh, number of patents or uh, reference of the papers in the IEEE Explore. And also the students, researchers, and faculty members need to be kept abreast with the development and practical application of emerging technologies. So it's really quite a lot we can talk about. So I'm not able to cover everything in detail and I'm not even an expert as well within just one hour. But I'm hoping that I have been giving you some uh, pointers whereby, whereby you can get a lot of those information. 
You can get them even that you are not a member. They're publicly available. So again, I can confirm that IEEE support initiatives are behind that 4IR. As you can see, well, we put in a million dollars or so, well, into each of those IoT, well, big data, um, Internet of Things, and all those things. So again, come back to our mission and vision, IEEE. We are advancing technology for benefits of humanity. So all in all, so I finished my talk now, and I'm hoping that you're able to make good use well, of the resources, and we're going for the bright new future. And I thank you very much for your attention, and let's advance well, emerging technologies for the benefit of humanity. So my name is Lance Fung. I have my website, lancefung.net, and you are more than welcome to get in touch with me, lancecfung at uh, IEEE.org. OK, so I finished my talk now. I'm going to stop my presentation. I pass the control well, back to you. Uh, I, I request uh, faculty members, if you have any question, you can uh, drop your question through chat box. And I also request students, if they have any question, they can send their question uh, to any of the faculty member, and they will be able to raise a uh, student's question through live meeting. Uh, any faculty member, if they want to ask a question, please. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, it's better put in a chat box, so it's easier for me to, I can read out for everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Ravi, sir, are you there, sir? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar? What will be the impact on fourth IR on education? Okay, very good question. So obviously from education point of view, well, you have to answer yourself, what is the purpose of education? Okay, so I would see that just like in any revolution, any changes. So from education point of view, you need to be well responsive well, to the changes. I know that in uh, India, you just recently have a release on the uh, NER, the new education policy. So I can see that they're providing you more flexibility. So it all depends on what is the role that you are in education. From student point of view, then obviously, well, you need to keep yourself abreast. Uh, I would say that gone on the day, you just rely on the four years, three year, four years education. But really, you need to keep your interest well, uh, much more broadly. You also need to take a look at what's going on. Uh, from the educator's point of view, then obviously, well, for the um, curriculum development that you really have to uh, look into what is your specialization and how you see well i would encourage that you really need to talk to the industry okay so that you can uh, understand but i would say that much more important areas is really the fundamental structure of education could be changing as well i personally do not if you ask me i do not really believe that well, our current system of one certificate and one curriculum well for all well is really suitable in the sense that students are individuals and then also uh, some of them well, they might be faster some are slower then I, I personally see that under the 4IR can be adoption of these um, blockchain techniques. Well, I would say that you could be even go into customization of the curriculum for each individual student. So when they go for look for job, well, they really have this specific well, profile behind them so you can match to the job. Well, I myself sometimes I pity the, the company. If we imagine a company have to go through well, hundreds or hundreds of applications, all having the same qualification, same certificate, same transcript. What does the transcript included? I just did one year, okay, second year, computer technology, I got a four, uh, 99%. What does it mean? What does it mean relating to the job itself? So I do see that if you ask me, well, given a choice, I would even look into some kind of micro-credential well, for each individual course they've gone through. So there's a lot of possibility. Okay, how to start research in the areas of self-driving car? Then of course, the first thing is you must read a lot. Okay, you must read. There's so many things you can work on. So again, I do not know what is your area of interest. So a lot of autonomous vehicles, well, they're looking to maybe on the hardware aspect. Well, I, I know that well, uh, people looking at, well, um, in UWA, well, I, I know there's a professor working on the mechanic. They even build a car themselves, all right? So there's some people looking, a lot of them just simply on the brains. But I would say one of the very interesting problem, well, in autonomous vehicle is on the ethics. What I'm trying to say is, okay, 
On the principal side, you may look at it, it's very simple. Okay, we have some kind of sensor. We have some kind of uh, uh, detecting uh, the, the car in front of the stop. But I would say a much more interesting part is, well, how are you going to prevent the car injure other people? Now, it's not only just saying you stop, it's, it's sufficient. Because, say, for example, if I, I, I give one scenario, well, what you call a trolley problem. If you have a passenger on your car, and then, well, it's supposed to be autonomous. Now you come to the red light, you stop. Then you just realize there is a car behind you. It's coming at you at 100 miles per hour. Are you going to stop waiting for it to ram into you? Or are you going to straight away, or if, I were, if, I were, if I see some car behind me, if I react fast enough, straight away, I'm going to drive through it. I'm not care it's going to be a red light or not, isn't it? So is the car, autonomous car, able to know this? What is the ethical decision you have to make? I can make the problem even a little bit more trickier. Now, if I'm going to drive through the red light, somebody is passing while well, going through the road. If I'm going to drive through the, the red light, well, on one hand, I violate the, the traffic rule, but I'm going to run into that person. Okay, I have another dilemma. If I stop, the car behind me is going to ram into it. Well, I'm going to kill the passenger on my car. If I'm going to say, oh, I can turn to the side of the road, then I can avoid, um, avoid the guy in front of me. I can avoid the car behind me. What happened on the side of the road? You have a bunch of school kids. So if I'm going to turn to the side of the road, so how are you going to make your autonomous vehicle intelligent enough to make such ethical problem? That has been one of the main problems we are facing. Again, IEEE, we have this uh, new initiative called Global Ethics on Autonomous and Intelligent System. Take a look at that. So that will be dealing with a lot of uh, ethical problem now. I would say this is the next area of AI is a challenging problem. One student asking about future of self-driving car. I think I've answered that part already. So what is the future? Now, it's autonomous vehicles, there are different levels. I think all the way go up to level five. Some of the earliest level, we have already got it already. Are you talking about, well, even cruise control? To a certain extent, it's a little bit of a self-driving. You don't need to, uh, uh, when you're driving, you don't need to, uh, you take it for granted. Well, and then uh, you also have things like even self-parking. Okay, you can have a car. Well, you do not even need to park it. You can, you can use a mobile phone that can come out by, by its own. But of course, in the ideal case as well, you can be entirely well, running on this car on the road. That's what it's supposed to be. Well, but then again, in reality, I think some of those are ethical problems we're still dealing with. And also in terms of the laws, I haven't catch up on that one. So if you ask me what's the future, I would say they're coming up. Okay, it all depends what level it is and then how are we going to take care of that in the laws. Well, so all these technologies are taking us to the advanced future, but at some point, the, te the technology advancement are getting impact, such as rise in unemployment. How you would suggest IGBE can contribute in this direction? Even the contributions from IGBE is not reaching the normal people and remains at very upper level. How can we make it reach to every individual? Okay, there's a two part of the questions in here. One is on the employment. Now, first of all, I must say that IGBE is not an employment agent. Okay, so in other words, well, we, I, I cannot claim to you that IGB will give you jobs. Okay, I make it very clear. So we are a professional organization. We're advancing technologies for the advancement of uh, benefit of humanity. But in terms of the unemployment, if you look back to history, every change of technology will lose jobs. Face it, we got no choice. In the past, well, people raising the, uh, before steam engine come, well, people can make a living driving on a horse. But now do you see any people on us? Maybe you still some people on that. So you have to realize it, changes are coming. So it is not the technology take away your job. The question is, are you able to adapt yourself to new jobs? Are you able to create new jobs? I've already said it already. I didn't share in this particular presentation. In the past, I have other presentation. I have two articles from the same, well, from Forbes magazine, just in a matter of a couple of weeks. First magazine, well, first article talking about, oh, losing a job is not the end of it, AI, all this thing. You see, a, you see a cartoon, a robot tapping on somebody's shoulder, taking the guy out of a job. On another article, I've already mentioned, 58 million jobs is going to be created. So it all depends which side are you. Are you going to be sitting on some sunset industry? So in that case, when you lose your job, then you cannot blame any people. So what I'm trying to say is, IEEE, we're doing our best to equipping our members and the community. Our objective is advancing technology for the benefit of humanities. If you take a look at our strategic plan 2020 to 2025, one of it is enhancing public understanding of technology. 
Okay, so you can take a look at that. Well, IEEE is not responsible for losing of jobs. IEEE, we are doing advancing technology. It's up to the members, up to the communities, okay? Again, you have to look, talk to your government, really, job, all these things, the policy itself, okay? So how can we make it rich to every individual? Also, another thing I didn't share in this talk is IEEE, we also have the, well, I myself actually initiate something called Reaching Local. Well, we can try to reach out to the people in the local languages. So you mentioned about the upper level. I understand what you mean. Maybe you talked about the educated part. How about some of those where they haven't got English? This is where IEEE comes in. We are now initiating some uh, projects. We expect the members to reach out to the locals in the local languages. So we have this website called Try Engineering. If you take a look at the select the language, well, you can select language like Hindi, like the Tamil, uh, like Gujarati, some of those different languages are available. Okay, so if you are members, you do your part, okay? I always say that, well, don't ask what IEEE can do for you. Ask you what you can do for IEEE and also what you can do for the community. Okay, how are four IR impact of teaching methodology? I've already mentioned it briefly already. So I can see that well, it could have a more personalized uh, uh, teaching, well, more personalized curriculum. And also a lot of these uh, AI technique and also being in gradually going into this uh, learning analytic. Well, if you take a look at some of my uh, students' thesis, one of the um, uh, earlier ones, I think the name is Kendall Kwan. Uh, what we have done is uh, we have done a research work, uh, I think based on 24,000 uh, record. Well, her thesis is about this. When you have a student coming into the university, he or she doesn't know what course well, uh, they should take. A lot of time they might rely on the information from the parents, well, from the peer, but sometimes they rely information from the counselor, the university counselor. Then how does the university counselor, well, give the advice? A lot of time, maybe some personal opinion or maybe see whichever courses will need some more students. But what we, our work has done is, we try to match the record of the 24,000 students from their past um, undergrad, uh, uh, the school levels, and also some interest, and also their final results. Because from an education point of view, we do not want to see student fails. Maybe student doesn't, be, uh, they don't believe it. Actually, we never want student fail. Because when student fail, we lose all the, all the, um, uh, uh, all the, all the investment into the student. So we try to match the student past record background to the success. So we're not saying that, well, if you match this model, then definitely you success. We're not saying that a lot of factors can, can lead to somebody's success. But we're saying that we can only advise to the student, well, from the past record, well, these people with this background, these are the courses may be recommended because they have the higher chances of success. That's all we can say, okay? So these are some one examples. All right, and then also you can see a lot of the, my other work is on the games and how to have different areas of um, for education. Strong AI, high versus reality. Well, take a look in terms of the um, uh, gardeners. Uh, there's something, well, they have this uh, high, high cycle. It all depends how you define strong AI. I know that, well, there are people getting worried about general AI and all those things. It all depends, well, how are we able to uh, confine and restrain them. It could be a reality because uh, we do not know. But uh, again, well, people have to keep tap on it, okay? But I look at the ethical well, design is one of the main areas we can work on. So again, it's up to you. Well, if you are the researchers, well, you can make some decision. You can see that, well, is it going to be reality or high? So though there are various advantages of 4 i hours, still it got many negative impacts, such as the climate change, a massive industrialization, increased urbanization, excess deforestation, limited resource depletion. You give me answer. I never say 4 i hour is the um, uh, is the medicine for all, okay? Well, if you take a look in terms of all these things, I agree with you about climate change, but again, you take a look at 4 i hour is only, well, the technology behind it, you can apply into it, well, how are you gonna address the issue? Well, mass industrialization, well, I, actually, I think that it's not gonna be happen that much now. Actually, now they're pulling out a lot of those uh, from China, and uh, increased urbanization. Increased urbanization is not dealing with the industry, it's dealing with the population, okay? Excessive deforestation. Uh, Again, it's not a technology, it's a policy, it's a business, it's the government. Are they able to control it? Okay, so I'm not too sure what is your point of driving at. You could be taking a very negative view of 4IR, you can sit back, okay? Then you can complain about losing all this job, 
But nevertheless, it's up to you to decide. Well, always two sides of a coin, positive and negative. Well, you can always look at negative, don't do anything. But on the other hand, you can also be making a positive impact. And I rely on you, OK? What will happen if the learning rate is too slow or too fast while learning a model? And actually, this is one of the main problems with dealing with the learning. Uh, I'm talking, assuming you're talking about machine learning, all those things. Nowadays, well, they rely a lot of those. Well, if it is too slow, or you put on a much more faster uh, machine uh, up to the cloud, that's what's happening now. Well, too high, well, it doesn't really matter. Play around with it. Okay, learning rate, uh, no single answer of that one. A question from a student, which is the most complex field of uh, work in the 4 I L? I do not, I, my question come back to you is a, give me a complex, okay? How to define complex, okay? So I'll give you all kind of things. I would say that for any work, research work you're looking into, look deep into it, they are complex enough. If you're able to solve a problem, there's no end, any problem at all. We only work on a limited time that we have. Student from second year, student asking most complex fields in for our same thing, well, same answers. It all depends on how we define complex. Okay? So you define complex first, then I can tell you you can compare with it. All right? Okay, I think I answer all the questions now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now I, okay, I would thank like, you. Yes, sir. I would like to invite uh, Dean Academic and Research Professor Shishan Kumar for vote of thanks. So on behalf of uh, Computer Society of India chapter located at this university, along with JP University of Engineering and Technology, I wish to mention our gratitude for your uh, good deliberation. You have provided good insight of uh, force industrial revolution and how it can be utilized in different technological domains, especially related to uh, electrical and electronics and similar other domains of uh, IT and uh, mechanical and other industries also. Your inputs are definitely, I'm very sure, sir, it will be helpful for our faculty members as well as, well as students to grow in their area of specialization and fields wherever they are working. Further, sir, we'll wish to collaborate with you in future activities also. And at the same time, we rest, we assure you that our support will also be there for your uh, coming uh, election, what, for which voting is on in our IEEE portfolio. Best wishes to you, sir. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot for your time and thanks a lot for your input. Thanks, okay, once again, thank you so much for having me. Okay, I hope answered as much of the question as I could. Well, honestly, well, I, I, I don't have all the answers. Okay, I agree. There are some, some other questions are coming. Thank you. Thank you. I will send you, sir, on mail. Okay, then. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you, thank sir. you again. Thank all right. You, so, thank good you. evening. Okay, bye bye for now. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Okay.